Welcome to lesson 12 of your journey of life, which is all about UK politics. So let's make a start. The Houses of Parliament in London are generally regarded as the seat of power in the UK, but this hasn't always been the case. So let's take a quick look at the history of Parliament. We need to go back to 1215 in England, to the signing of the Magna Carta, which limited the King's power over the Church and began to give power to the people. In 1430, the 40 shilling franchise was established, meaning only people who owned or rented land with an income of 40 shillings or more were allowed to vote, and it remained in place for the next 400 years. The Reform Act of 1832 was the first act to make representation fairer by changing constituency boundaries and allowed one in seven men to vote. By 1866, MP John Stuart Mill presented the first petition to allow women to vote. But it was more than 50 years later, in 1918, that women finally received the right to vote. Even then, they could only vote if they were over 30 and had some rights to property. However, all men over the age of 21 were given the right to vote in 1918. Ten years later, in 1928, the Equal Franchise Act gave women equal voting rights to men. And in 1969, the age at which both men and women could vote was lowered from 21 to 18, which still stands today. The last major change to UK politics was in 1999, when devolution was enacted, meaning individual parliaments were formed for Wales, Scotland and later Northern Ireland, giving them some control over the laws of their own countries. So as a British citizen, once you turn 18, you become eligible to vote but it's important that you know you must register to vote first. You can't just turn up at a polling station on election day. You can register to vote from the age of 16, but you cannot vote until you are 18. To register, go online to the government website and search register to vote. So let's have a look at how the voting system works. As of 2010, the UK is divided into 650 constituencies and a Member of Parliament, or MP, is elected to represent each constituency. The current system used for UK elections was first introduced in 1832, and is called First Past the Post, which means that the candidate with the most votes in each constituency wins that seat in Parliament, becoming that constituency's MP. If a political party wins more than half the seats available, which is currently 326, they go on to form the government. So, for example, there are four candidates representing four political parties in one constituency, parties A, B, C and D. You can see party D has 40,000 votes, which is easily the majority of the total number of votes, and so they would take their seat in the House of Commons. In some circumstances, the majority of the constituency does not vote for the person who becomes their MP. But that person received more votes than anyone else they were running against. Take a look at this example. Party A, 2,000. Party B, 5,000. Party C, 12,000. And Party D, 15,000. So in the first past the post system, Party D takes the seat in Parliament. But totalling up the votes for the other parties shows that 19,000 people didn't vote for that MP. But that MP represents that constituency, even though the majority of voters did not vote for that candidate. This brings us on to the topic of proportional representation. In the UK, the party that takes over the seat of power in Parliament is not necessarily the party that the majority of people voted for, meaning that the first-past-the-post system in the UK may not create a government that proportionally represents what the British people voted for. For example, if we look back through history, in 1951, the Labour Party won 48.8% of the vote. However, the Labour government was thrown out of office and replaced by a Conservative majority government who actually won fewer votes, but won the most seats. And in 1974, the Conservative Party won the most votes, but Labour got the most seats. 
So in a system of proportional representation, the amount of seats in Parliament would reflect the amount of votes for each party. This system is used in many other countries, and there are many who believe it is a system we should adopt in the UK. So which party should you vote for? Well, that is completely up to you, but it's important that you make your own decision and you shouldn't feel pressured to vote the same way as anyone else. To help you make a decision, each political party creates a manifesto, which is basically a public pledge of policies and aims. Many people choose a political party which aligns with their political ideologies, meaning a set of ideas which together form a political theory. You'll often hear these ideologies being referred to as being left-wing or right-wing. But what does that mean exactly? Well, political parties that align themselves on the right tend to focus more on capitalism and want less intervention by the state. Those which tend to favour the left tend to focus on socialism and a fairer distribution of wealth. Those who occupy what we would call the centre ground are more liberal in their views. Political extremism is where your views are very much towards the left or right, and some political parties can appear to be extremely left-wing or right-wing when you scrutinise their manifesto. As the manifesto is only a series of pledges or promises, you can also look at that party's previous record, if they've been in power before, to decide where that party sits on the political spectrum. In the UK, the largest political parties tend to position themselves relatively close to the centre, as this manages to keep the vast majority of people in the country happy. And the parties with the most extreme views tend to get comparatively less votes at election. So when deciding who to vote for, you should read each party's manifesto and find all of the promises and plans each political party has. And you can also watch political debates and broadcasts where manifesto pledges are scrutinised. Then you should have enough information to decide which political party you most closely align with. But it is important to remember that when you vote, you are not voting directly for the next Prime Minister, and you're not simply voting for a political party. You are voting for your local MP. So it's also really important to find out who is running to be your local MP and look at what their pledges for your constituency are. If they've been an MP before, it's a good idea to look at their voting record to see if they align with the things that you are passionate about. Have a look at their voting record, because whenever there is a debate in Parliament about a change to the law, your MP will vote either for or against the motion, and their decision is recorded for you to view. Head over to theyworkforyou.com and type in your postcode to find your local MP. You will then be able to have a look at their voting record and see if this aligns with your views. OK. Now let's have a look at how the UK Parliament is structured. It sits in the House of Parliament, which is also known as the Palace of Westminster. What you may not know is that Parliament comprises three parts. The House of Commons, which has all the green seats you often see on the television, where the Prime Minister speaks. The House of Lords, which has the red seats. And then finally, there's the reigning monarch, which is currently King Charles III. The House of Commons is where elected MPs sit. The House of Lords is made up of people who are not elected, but are chosen because of their speciality or expertise in a particular area. The King, as the reigning monarch, meets the Prime Minister once a week and approves any new laws, which is known as giving royal assent. So how is Parliament different to the government? Well, the government is made up of the party that has the most seats after a general election. The rest of the MPs, who aren't part of the governing party, are known as the opposition, and they are there to scrutinise and challenge any laws or debates that go on in Parliament. OK, now it's time to consider how politics affects you. Parliament gets to make our laws, 
but they also have the power to change or to remove laws too. Some examples of this is that before 1967, being a homosexual was against the law. And until 1918, women were not allowed to vote until the law was changed. So just as these laws have been changed, adapted or removed, current laws can be changed too.